Hello my friends, very warm welcome to this video. My name is Dr. Sayed Kazmi and you're watching the medical channel which means the world of uh, pediatrics, public health and epidemiology simplified. And in today's video, I'm going to talk about uh, scalp swellings in neonates. Now, uh, most uh, newborn uh, scalp swellings uh, are related to the forces uh, which are exerted on the head of the baby by the birth canal or the use of uh, assistive equipment uh, uh, during delivery. Now most of these problems are usually self-limited and they do resolve within a couple of days to weeks um, although some of these uh, swellings might require closer uh, monitoring. Uh, these swellings they still may occur despite use of skilled obstetric and neonatal care and studies have shown that caesarean sections are associated less frequently with uh, swelling as compared to vaginal deliveries. Uh, and as I told you earlier that majority of these uh, swellings are self-limiting and they would resolve within a few weeks but sometimes rarely they can cause uh, complications. Now uh, there are different types of scalp swellings but the most common ones uh, in order of uh, decreasing uh, frequency uh, is number one molding, number two caput succedaneum, number three cephal hematoma, number four subcalial hemorrhage and number five very rarely crani cranial or a meningocele or cranial and cephalocele. Now molding is one of the most uh, common ones and it is caused by the uh, overriding of the skull bones as the baby is passing uh, through the uh, birth canal and uh, the forces exerted uh, by the contraction of the uterus causes uh, the skull bones to slightly override one another. So what happens is that that causes uh, a bit of bumps on the head of the newborn and um, if you uh, spread your hand on the head of the newborn you might see that posteriorly uh, some of the bones might be a bit more up as compared to the uh, frontal bones. So that is molding and it usually resolves in a couple of uh, weeks. And the second one is caput succedaneum. Caput succedaneum is usually uh, what we call as a subdermal uh, uh, swelling. It's caused by uh, edema. Uh, in the subcutaneous tissue of the scalp and you would see a sort of a pitting edema of the scalp uh, which is not uh, bounded by the um, suture line so it's a more uniform swelling which might be on the whole of the head or it might be on the half of the head but this swelling does cross the suture line in other words it is not limited by the suture line and it's usually has got a uh, pitting edema uh, to it the third one is cephal hematoma and cephal hematoma as the name says it's a, a hematoma it's a, the actually collection of blood uh, beneath the skin and this type of swelling is actually um, uh, limited by the suture lines so it's a localized swelling and uh, most of the times like caput succedaneum it would resolve by itself but really if it's a large cephal hematoma uh, the uh, bleeding might lead to extended jaundice for a few days or another important thing is rarely that is usually around five to ten percent of the times a cephal hematoma might be associated with the underlying skull fracture then uh, is the subcalial hemorrhage subcalial hemorrhage or the, uh, as we call it the subaponeurotic uh, hemorrhage is a very uh, worrisome type of bleeding which is caused uh, by the trauma to the diploic veins uh, which are present under the gallia aponeurotica uh, that can occur usually with the uh, traumatic uh, deliveries and there is also an increased incidence of subcalial hemorrhage with the uh, vacuum extraction and last but not the least uh, meningocele and encephalocele in the cranial areas which has actually protrusion of the meninges or the actual brain matter uh, through any part of the skull uh, usually associated with um, other cranial uh, the other brain abnormalities as well uh, that is quite rare uh, so uh, just a few key points in the history uh, when you're taking the history you might uh, keep it in mind that they are associated with some of these swellings for example the molding and caput succedaneum are usually evident right after birth uh, but um, sometimes a cephal hematoma or a subcalial hemorrhage may take hours to form or become evident so it's not necessarily that they would be present right at the time of the birth they can present uh, even if after two or three uh, days after the birth uh, remember that uh, obesity, maternal obesity, maternal diabetes, maternal short stature, these are the risk factors for molding, even for caput, for cephal hematoma, even for subgallial hemorrhage. 
Similarly, uh, fetal risk factors like a large uh, fetus, a large baby, or cephalopelvic disproportion uh, in the mother, like a big baby and a small pelvis, or the use of instruments during vaginal deliveries are the newborn risk factors for uh, molding, for caper, for cephal hematoma, and even for subgallial hemorrhage. Uh, well, uh, remember that cephal hematomas, uh, though most of the times are innocent and uh, they are just caused by, you know, hematoma formation, uh, subperiosteal hematoma formation uh, in the skull bones, and that's why they are limited by the suture lines. Rarely, around 5 to 10 percent of them, they might also be associated with the underlying skull fracture, which is quite difficult to pick up in the, uh, in the initial examination. So now coming down to the key points in physical examination which we, before we move on and talk about discreetly about each of these swelling. Remember that the swelling in caput succedaneum it crosses the suture line because it is above the skull bones and it is in the subcutaneous tissue. So its edema is there in the subcutaneous tissue and it tends to have pitting edema. Remember cephal hematoma never has got pitting edema while caput uh, uh, succedaneum always has got pitting edema. Uh, similarly, a caput may also be associated with a hollow scalp ring of alopecia because the um, it's actually the result of prolonged pressure of the scalp against the cervical or so that area because it's got taken some pressure there might be no hair um, at that particular uh, level. Uh, Kefal hematomas um, in contrast to um, uh, caput they are tense and as I told you they do not cross the suture lines because they are limited by the boundary of the periosteum because these are subperiosteal bleeds. Uh, remember, sometimes, rarely, a cephal hematoma uh, may become calcified and uh, though this usually resolves, but uh, it can be a small uh, and non-tender calcified swelling as well if it doesn't resolve completely. And uh, as far as cephal hematoma is concerned, there is no discoloration of the scalp um, unless and until there is an overlying caput or bruising in the subcutaneous tissue. While the subgallial hem, uh, hematomas, uh, subgallial hemorrhages, if you are examining, remember they are fluctuant masses and they would cross the uh, suture lines. And sometimes when you are uh, trying to palpate these swellings, you they may be associated with a fluid wave or sometimes even with, uh, you know, a chymosis behind the ear. Uh, which can extend to other areas of the scalp. So mistakenly, it can be, you know, associated with child abuse as well. Uh, but that's why the thorough examination is very important because um, you might falsely attribute it to child abuse, though the fact that has been caused by subgallial hemorrhage. Now, the uh, as far as the meningocele and cephalocele in the cranial area are concerned, they are usually pulsatile midline uh, cyst-like masses which usually have got a small sac with a pedunculated stalk. And if you, uh, you know, dim the lights and um, shine them through a torch, they will, they both will transilluminate. And uh, the neural, especially in case of encephalocele, you might even see the neural tissue. Uh, okay, so moving on to the next slide, let's talk about uh, the swelling one by one. So here you can see that this is uh, the most common scalp swelling which is known as the molding of the skull and you can see that there has been a bit of a superior and posterior elevation of the skull bones and this is caused by the pressure of the contracting uterus as the baby is passing through the uh, birth canal. So this leads to a bit of like distortion in the uh, um, skull bones but over a period of time usually um, days to weeks this corrects by itself so it doesn't require any treatment. So this is molding of the skull. Uh, moving on to the next slide here, you can see uh, on this, uh, on the left side here, if I mark now, this is the area where you can see pitting edema of the scalp. And I told you that pitting edema is only seen in caput succedaneum. So this is a caput succedaneum, which is a generalized swelling um, of the scalp because this is edema of the subcutaneous tissue and this edema is pitting edema. So if you press your finger onto this swelling and keep it pressed, you will see that there, a pit would be formed and that pit would remain for some time before it comes back uh, to normal shape. Here on the right side, uh, in the top right here, you can see that this baby has got a protrusion swelling in the posterior and superior part of the skull 
which you can see it's not confined to any one suture line it's quite like you know extending to almost three-fourth of his scalp and again this is a classical example of an extensive caput succedaneum and again the caput succedaneum is usually associated with vacuum extraction and some other risk factors and uh, okay uh, this is a subcutaneous tissue and if you press it there would be pitting edema now in contrast look at this one over here in the right lower corner so this is cephalematoma so there is a localized swelling a localized pump which would be is is actually confined to the suture line so there is a parietal suture going in here uh sagittal suture over here and there would be lambdoid suture at the back so this is you can see that this is confined by the suture lines and this is caused by a uh, subperiosteal bleeding and that's why it is uh, confined by the uh, suture lines this is how you differentiate caput from kephil hematoma so that is a more generalized swelling the kephil hematoma is a more localized swelling uh, caput succedaneum is not um, uh, limited by the suture lines kephil hematoma is always limited by the suture lines okay here again uh, you can see a localized swelling over here which is uh, bounded by the suture line so yes this is a typical kephil hematoma another example of kephil hematoma over here this one is a big one on the left um, parietal bone again you can see there are boundaries which would be felt if you were actually examining and palpating the swelling by your own hands in contrast look at uh, this particular picture on the right so this is subgallial hemorrhage because this is generalized swelling looks more like caput but you can see there is an associated bruising towards the right temple bone so it seems like it is more prominent on the right side and is usually associated with some bruising as well because there might be a fluid well so if you just try to press in here you might feel the, uh, the you know if you press here you might feel the fluid wave on the other side as well because this is hemorrhage below the uh, gallia aponeurotica and gallia aponeurotica is covering the whole skull so this is actually uh, you know this swelling is moving over the whole uh, skull surface and because of the uh, gravity uh, sometimes it can just like track in one particular corner where it might be associated with a bit of bruising uh, in this down picture it's a subgallial hemorrhage but you can see the bruising at the back of the left ear so because because of the gravity the uh, blood has come down and has accumulated in this area giving rise to a bruise now this might be mistaken for a child abuse because obviously we take any bruising behind the ears especially we here we are talking about neonates newborns that is taken very seriously so a proper history is very important because otherwise this might be attributed to wrongly attributed to uh, child abuse though in fact this has been caused by subgallial hemorrhage so as far as uh, the kefal hematoma and subgallial hemorrhages are concerned because they are both hemorrhages uh, most of the times they would resolve on its own but sometimes because there is if there is a massive accumulation of blood and you know neonate is a small structure what can happen is that it can lead to shock if there is a lot of uh, blood loss in this uh, uh, subgallial area or there's a lot of blood loss as a kefal hematoma then the child may go into shock if the child is not in shock um, sometimes these large hemorrhages as the bilirubin breaks down and this clotted blood uh, it can uh, lead to extensive jaundice uh, sometimes to the extent that the child may require phototherapy so this is also uh, to be kept in mind so when you are examining these kids the first thing important is you take a complete history and you see if uh, there were any risk factors which can be attributed to these swellings obviously if a vacuum extraction has been applied and the child has got uh, uh, caput succedaneum that is the cause similarly if there was a forceps delivery a difficult uh, um, uh, labor and the child comes up with a kephal hematoma uh, you know the important thing to keep in mind here and during your physical examination is to see if the child is well or unwell so if the child is in shock obviously you have to treat it as a shock because of these conditions if the child is extensively jaundiced then you have to treat the child for jaundice so you have to take their serum bilirubin levels obviously you have to look at the direct and indirect um, levels and if they are above uh, the treatment line on the nomograms then they have to be admitted for phototherapy or sometimes in severe cases for uh, exchange transfusion as well but if there is uh, no extensive jaundice or the bilirubin levels are below uh, the treatment line and the child is otherwise fine there are no other social concerns then obviously the 
there is no treatment for it you just give them reassurance and you tell them that it's going to go away in a couple of days obviously some parents are more concerned because they think it's a bit disfiguring for their child but there's nothing much that can be done about it except if there are complications and the parents have to be given reassurance if they're very anxious you just tell them that it will go away in a couple of days uh, sometimes it takes even weeks so this whole prognosis should be explained to them you should tell them that in case if there is uh, extended jaundice or if the child seems unwell then in the uh, re-examination and um, a review is warranted in that particular case but otherwise in most of the cases these swellings they go on their own in a couple of days to weeks so just to uh, look at uh, uh, this thing from uh, a generalized uh, view so molding is caused by overlapping of bones along the suture lines and it is caused by uh, the molding of the skull bones or overriding of the skull bones as the baby is passing through the uh, birth canal so overlapping of bones along the suture lines and it is present at birth and usually resolved in the first few weeks of life caput succedinium as i told you it's a soft swelling that crosses suture lines and has got irregular borders uh you might see dependent edema on one side it's usually if you press it there is a pitting edema if it's a large one it's usually present at the time of birth and resolves in the first few days to few weeks of life as far as kefal hematoma is concerned that is caused by a subperiostal hemorrhage that does not cross the suture line it's usually a dense swelling it's a focal one a small one usually involves the parietal area but can sometimes rarely be bilateral as well and usually it is not present at the time of birth it usually develops slowly over the first 24 hours of life and sometimes can take a couple of weeks to resolve even sometimes two to three months while subgallial uh, hemorrhage or hematoma this is a fluctuant uh, swelling that crosses suture lines just like caput um, but the only thing is that uh, it can have a fluid wave uh, sometimes if it is a big one and this usually develops shortly after birth and again it can last weeks sometimes it just progresses and when it progresses it can lead to shock so that you have to uh, keep in your mind now as far as the uh, cranial and uh, meningocele and encephaloceles are concerned if you look at these pictures there is a large cranial encephaloceles so there is a protrusion of the cranial elements usually the neuronal tissue along with its meningeal sac either through the here you can see it is through the occipital area but here you can see that it is happening through the frontal area of so it's got usually a pedunculated stalk with a sac like structure and if you shine light through it to in, in a darkened room you might see uh, transillumination uh, if it is just completely transformed it simply means that there is no neuronal tissue inside and it's just a cystic sac which in that case it would be meningocele but if there is a brain tissue in it then we would call it encephalocele and these kids they usually have got um, uh, problems uh, and, um, because they might be paralyzed uh, because of the herniation of uh, brain contents into these sacs and usually they require a lot of testing which uh, would include karyotyping which would include genetic studies and obviously uh, MRI scans to see the extent and what else is wrong within the uh, central nervous system they usually are present right at the time of birth and um, they require a lot of work up but uh, they are not they cannot be corrected uh, um, uh, by themselves uh, they obviously you have to do surgery on them so they have to be referred to the pediatric neurosurgeon so cranial meningocene and cephalocele are usually associated with uh, genetic or with uh, chromosomal abnormalities uh, these kids are definitely have got like a lot of uh, other issues as well and they require extensive testing which include MRI uh, and other uh, you know testing depending on what you suspect and they have to be referred to the neurosurgeons for um, resection and repair of uh, these types of swellings so this was a brief lecture on the differential diagnosis of uh, cranial swellings in newborns and neonates i hope you have enjoyed this lecture learned something new and if you have liked this video please uh, give me a thumbs up and if you haven't subscribed so far to my channel please do subscribe uh, as it helps and gives me motivation to make further videos so if you've got, still got any question uh, comment or query put it down in the comment section below and i will try my level best to answer it as soon as possible have a good day and bye bye